So this is a tutorial about cranial nerves. Uh, I think this might be the easiest way to learn them. Uh, I want to explain upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons, the pyramidal system and the extrapyramidal system, and the requirements for spasticity and bilateral innervation of the cranial nerves. So I think the easiest way to start is by looking at a relatively simple nerve, the spinal nerves. So I'm going to give you an example of a spinal motor nerve that supplies the uh, muscles to the rest of the body, something that we're not usually used to dealing with in speech pathology. So a typical nerve will start in the cerebral cortex up in the motor strip up here. It will go through the internal capsule down to the midbrain, through the pons to the medulla. And this is where 90% of spinal nerves decussate. They cross the body to the opposite side. And then they continue right down to the rest of the spine. And where they finish up, that depends on which muscle they're innovating. So, you know, an arm muscle versus a leg muscle leg will be lower, more inferior in the spine. So they synapse at the appropriate level. And from there, within the spinal cord, the next nerve starts at that synapse, comes out of the spinal cord, and feeds into the muscle itself. Innovates that muscle directly. So you can see from this that there's a clear division and it's different for each nerve. The green one here is the upper motor neuron, and the blue one there is the lower motor neuron, and I think it's pretty obvious why they're called that. Green is upper motor neuron, and the lower motor neuron feeds actually into the muscle. So let me just show that again in the coronal section. So it starts in the motor cortex, goes through the internal capsule, into the midbrain, through the pons, and then as I said, when they get to the medulla, 90% of them decussate, and then they go down to, for whatever length, down the spine, and that's where they synapse. So the decussation is there. And the lower motor neuron takes over, feeds out of the spine and out to the muscle. The other name for the green one here is the pyramidal system. So let me draw a little pyramid. The reason it's called that is because um, as they travel through the brainstem here, they travel right through the anterior part. And if you were to look at the front, so along this edge here, that's what you get in this far right picture. So they actually travel right through these parts here bilaterally. And evidently, somebody decided that they look like pyramids, two little pyramids sticking out of the medulla. So that's why they're called the pyramidal system. Or pyramidal tract. But there's also other nerves that influence the muscles even though they don't feed directly. And this is the extrapyramidal system. So you'll have a lot of nerves coming in from the cerebellum, a lot from the premotor cortex via the basal ganglia. You get some sensory input from the thalamus, information from the vestibular system, all of those have an impact on the nerves, but they don't kind of directly contact the, or directly control the lower motor neuron itself. Um, so they are called the extra pyramidal system. Extra pyramidal system. Now, an important thing to think about here is spasticity. So how does spasticity occur? 
we take the example of a stroke in the cortex somewhere, so maybe in the motor cortex itself, the upper motor neuron is damaged, and the important role of uh, upper motor neuron in spasticity is it has an inhibitory effect on the stretch reflex. Without that inhibitory effect of the upper motor neuron, it's there to tell it to relax, not to be so uh, sensitive. So the lower motor neuron over contracts, and you get spasticity. So overreacts to being stretched. So you wouldn't get that with a motor, lower motor neuron lesion. That's literally cutting the nerve, so the muscle just goes limp. It's just pulling the power cord out. But to get spasticity, you need upper motor neuron lesion. All right, so that's a spinal nerve. As I said, not something we're used to dealing with. If we move down and talk about the cranial nerves now. So the cranial nerves are different, obviously. They're called cranial nerves because they're contained completely within the cranium. They don't need the spine, generally. So let me give you an example of a cranial nerve. They start in the same place in the motor cortex. They come through the internal capsule, just like spinal nerves. Come down to the brainstem, just the same. But they decussate in different areas of the brainstem. And immediately after, they synapse. Or, you know, soon after. So again, they decussate. And then they synapse. So then the lower motor neuron begins within the brainstem. So for example, the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal, will exit from the pons out to the, to the muscles of mastication. So just remember, we're only talking about the motor aspects of cranial nerves here. So I'll show you again in the coronal section, starting in the motor cortex, usually down lower, the ones we're talking about, through the internal capsule here, into the midbrain, they'll decussate, and then they'll synapse. And then the fifth cranial nerve exits about here. I've also got the others we're interested in. Uh, facial nerve exits oop, about slightly higher, about here. The ninth and tenth from the medulla, and the twelfth sort of in the middle there. So we still have that division of upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons because one goes from the cortex to the synapse, the other one goes from the synapse to the muscle. Same as the spinal cord. We also still have the pyramidal system and the extrapyramidal system, same as uh, spinal cord. Let me just write those in. Lower motor neuron. So we still get upper and lower motor neurons, we still get pyramidal, extrapyramidal, but and this is the difference uh, between the cranial nerves and most spinal nerves. Cranial nerves are actually bilaterally innervated. So if we look at this coronal section, when it gets to the decussation, it also stays on its own side ipsilaterally. Or if we were to do the other side, cortex, internal capsule, and then that side synapses with its own side as well as the other side. And that's almost all of them without exception. But of course there are exceptions. So the trigeminal, completely bilateral. Glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, completely bilateral. Facial nerve. The exception is the lower face. So the lower face only accepts input from one side. The hypoglossal nerve is completely bilateral, except for the muscles of protrusion in the tongue. So those are the only exceptions of the ones we're interested in. So what does this mean? It means that in the case of a stroke, let's put a stroke here for instance. This poor person's having a right hemisphere stroke, 
if you follow this dark green, it's going to cut all the innovation to both sides, but it doesn't really matter because the other side can take over. So you don't get much weakness at all. And you also won't get the spasticity because you're still getting that inhibitory response from the other side. That's for the bilaterally innervated nerves. We can talk about the exceptions once more. This is an excellent diagram. Excellent diagram of the fifth cranial nerve. Sorry, the seventh facial nerve. You can see here the bilateral innervation for the top half of the face, so that's no problem. You can see them decussating here, feeding into both sides. In the lower half of the face, you only get that contralateral side, the orange. So imagine if there was a stroke to occur here, internal capsule. So all that orange you can see disappears. So what's left? Let's divide the face up. The upper left face is fine. The lower left face is fine. Upper right face is pretty good. The lower right face has weakness. So a left cortical stroke affects the facial nerve and you'll see that in the lower right face. Same with the tongue when they protrude it. A bit of a rough tongue. That will lean to the right because the muscle of protrusion on that side is not working, so it's getting pushed over. And that's really the only asymmetry you see in the cranial nerves with a stroke in that position or anywhere along this section. Okay, so it's a pretty you know useful setup to have in the case of a stroke. So you don't get weakness, you don't get spasticity for most of these nerves with a single stroke. How do we end up with weakness or spasticity? Well, you need to have a stroke on both sides, which would be unlucky, but it does happen. So it doesn't have to be exactly mirrored. It could be anywhere along that tract. Failing that, it would be a brainstem stroke. Now, if the person survives a brainstem stroke, which is not a given, because you've got all of the nerves in the brain bunching into that area, you can have innovation from both sides knocked out. And you'll get some severe damage and potentially spasticity, depending where it is. And also in a traumatic brain injury, you get bouncing and quite diffuse damage throughout the brain. And you, there's a high likelihood of spasticity in that case with traumatic brain injury. So hopefully that's explained upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons, pyramidal and extrapyramidal systems, spasticity, and bilateral innovation of the cranial nerves.